Welcome to the Disney Parks Podcast with your hosts, Tony Castlenova from DisneyByTheNumbers.com and Park Hopper John from WDWParkHoppers.com. Keep your hands, arms, feet, and legs inside the podcast at all times and get ready for the Disney Parks Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Disney Parks Podcast. We have a great show. Very excited uh, to bring this guest with you tonight. Uh, in 1969, Andrea McGann Keach landed the most coveted job at Disneyland, a tour guide. Uh, she escorted hundreds of groups through the park, uh, from regular families to foreign businessmen to rock and roll superstars. So you know I'm going to ask about that. Uh, her story is a time capsule of Disney and our culture. Anyone can visit Disneyland, but only the privileged could afford the luxury of a personal tour guide to lead them through the park. Uh, and in the book, Cream of the Crop, uh, Andrea pulls the wide curtain back uh, on the private world of Disneyland tour guides and her acceptance into that exclusive club. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Andrea McGann Keach. Well, thanks a lot for having me, John and Tony. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Uh, we'd like to ask everybody, Andre, uh, who, or not who, but how did your uh, uh, journey with Disney begin? Uh, when I was four years old, I lived in Southern California, and we heard about a park being built over in Anaheim, and it was so exciting. So I was there the first summer that Disneyland opened. And I was just remembering the other day writing an uh, introduction for another book I'm doing, my first lunchbox had the Mark Twain embossed on one side and the Jungle Cruise on the reverse side. Mm -hmm. So I have been excited and interested in Disney from the time it was built. I wrote a letter to the personnel office there years before I was old enough to work there asking what would be the minimum age. And I held on to everything that I ever touched that came across my desk. So I kept that letter. Yeah. And it's printed in the cream of the crop, what they said to me that you'll have to wait a few more years. Um, but then when I got to be 18, I immediately applied. And it was so exciting, but it was nerve-wracking and scary because I wanted it so much. But um, that's how I got started. From your recollections, mm. what was Disneyland like when it first opened in the the, the preceding years i mean you literally were on the ground floor yeah. of yep. of a cultural yep. shift what was that like what was the parks lot park like back then it was very simple it was very much simpler the trees were small um the caliber of the kinds of rides one of the chapters that i wrote about in the cream of the crop are the different things that are no longer there and how mm. strange it is to go to Disneyland today and it's almost like you look back through time and I can still see that giant rocket to Mars mm. that rose up out of Tomorrowland and still see Monster of the Whale and it's like it's all still there in your mind's eye but it's overlaid with the modern things right. so it's, it's very much a part of the history for those of us that live through it like I can still see where the mine where the Thunder Mountain Railroad is but that's where we used to ride the mules right I through um, yeah. the back lot wow. so <laughs> yeah I'll so it, it was just very much simpler the trees the landscaping nothing like what you have today it's just when you see what um the jungle looks like now in Adventureland versus those early years it was pretty sparse right but we were so excited sure. to have it well i'll ask the one question before we move on did you ever get a chance to meet walt himself my cousin did. My cousin was a couple of years older than me, and he got a job as a sweeper, which was the guys with the little dustpan cleaning up. Right. And he loved to work nights, and he worked really late at night. And he would usually be there, I would say the park closed at midnight, and he would be there till 2 a.m. And one night as he was walking through, finishing up his shift while Walt Disney walked by, and as you know, you don't call anyone Mr. Disney. Yeah. And he said that he, he always had our name tags on, and so he could call um, the cast members by their name. And he said to my cousin, hi, Jim. 
and Jim just smiled and said, hi, Walt, and, and kept going. But that was um, that was our only brush with greatness, was seeing Walt Disney there. That's fantastic. Yes, yes. And something all the, that my cousin told me, but also they repeated at Disney University, whenever he was walking through Disneyland, and I'm sure you've heard this before, but the first time we heard it, we thought it was hilarious. All the employees would tell each other, just as Bambi's mother said to her, man is in the forest. Yeah. And that would go from person to person, so you knew you better be on your A game. Right, yeah. yeah. We, we have heard that story. Man is in the forest. That's great. So how does one become a, a tour guide? And, and like, what kind of training is involved? Because it's kind of like a little specialized area. It's not, you know... You yeah, very much so. I mean, yeah. you just don't give yeah. somebody... You, you, I mean, you can give somebody a broom and a pan and say, all right, just go sweep the street. But to be a tour guide, there has to be some extra stuff and knowledge involved. That's right. That's right. It um, required more training. It was the highest paid of the jobs. And one thing I really learned early on, I had just turned 18 and walked in and had my first interview. And I thought that would be a, you know, maybe a 10 minute interview with somebody. But then they said, well, what would you consider doing? And I said, I'd consider one of two jobs. I'll either be a tour guide or I will be a waitress in the Blue Bayou restaurant, which had just opened. And I knew that you would get good tips doing that. And I was putting myself through college. So they said, oh, you, those are the only two things you want? I said, yep, that's what I want. So I think it really helps if you ask what you want. And, like, for example, my daughter worked at both parks later on in her life, and they immediately put her on Roger Rabbit, and she said, nope, I won't be doing that. What else do you have? So she wound up being one of the first women in the uh, pilot class to drive the submarines. Wow. Wow. So we think asking for what you want really helps there. And then it was one interview after another after another, and I eventually wound up having four interviews in a row that afternoon. And the final one, they said, well, now you're going to have to meet Sicily. And I thought, holy cow, is this some Italian guy or what? I didn't have any idea who Sicily was. Very proper British lady, very formidable. Um, She is a Disney legend. She's the one who founded the tour guides. Walt used to watch her. She was a main guest ticket seller and her line would always be longer than anybody else's because she was telling people how to do the park and the little guidebooks that you got have you seen those they're they're about maybe three by five inches they always gave them out when you came to the park and she would go through land by land and map out for people look you should do this this and this go in this order and so he asked her what are you doing why is your line always so long because he was always learning and she said well it doesn't really do them any good to just wander around I want to I want them to use their time well and make sure they get to see what they're interested in so he offered her the position of they started out with five tour guides three girls and two boys and she just built it from the ground up she she really took it and made it what it became by the time I was there gosh I feel like we had about mm, 50 or 60 girls and maybe there was 20 in the in the summer classes they had big classes in the summer I came on at Christmas and we only had about six of us but it was a big big group of people and we had a notebook it was maybe three inches thick and we were just basically expected to memorize it they just gave us this huge thing and of course not wanting to let go of anything to do with Disneyland I still have my notebook oh, wow. it's number 20 so they were their notebooks went from 19 to 21 because I kept 20 I could not give it up I loved it so much and the spiel that we had to learn it was 11 pages long and because I I was a bilingual guide. Well, I wasn't actually. I'd only had four years of high school Spanish, but I said, yep, I'll give it a go. So I also had to learn the speech in Spanish as well. So that's 22 pages in a very, very short amount of time. From the time we started training till the time I was out with the group was about a week. But it was a week of intensive training with Sicily and just drilling it. Um, And then we started going out with what they called our big sister 
because we would sort of tag along behind them and listen and watch, and then they would let us gradually do little parts of it, and then finally you would go out with your own first tour, and the big sister would go along with you to kind of watch to make sure you had it all down. And the first time I did my first tour, oh my gosh, I'll never forget it. I held up my crop with a little paper triangle and led my people right up the exit ramp that led to the train. And the gates are locked. There's no way they're letting you in through the exit. And I was just, just like, what in the world do I do now? So I just said, okay, everybody, turn around. We're we're going to go up a different staircase <laughs> and took them all back down and went up the right one. But, oh, Lord, I just thought, what an auspicious beginning to my right. first tour. <laughs> so, yeah, um, it was <laughs> pretty embarrassing. So as a tour guide, from from your experience, what were your, your job requirements? What were you expected to do for the guests? when they would come in and have you as their tour guide? Well, back in those days, it was only $6.50 for a guided tour. You could get in the park for $3, or you could have a guided tour for $6.50, which included five e-ticket rides. So it was a fairly good deal. And then they had an extra ticket at the end where they could pick whatever else they had seen that they wanted to go on. They could do that after the tour. We were expected to keep them entertained and chat with them and it was always so easy because in those days people came from all over the world so you could always ask tell me what it's like in Wisconsin or what's the fun things you guys like to do in Pennsylvania or that sort of thing it's easy to talk to them because every single person you dealt with all day long they were there to have a great time. Oh, right. yeah. So yeah. that made it just, it's just the absolute best working conditions you could imagine. And we had to follow a certain route and you would stop when you got to a certain point and you were expected to tell them the history and the meaning of some of these different things and how it came to be and things that Walt Disney had said about different lands, that sort of stuff, and had to know it by heart. Yeah. And then we took one little break with them and let them kind of wander around. Uh, eventually it was in New Orleans Square, which was really a cool place to hang out. And we finished up with Small World. And everybody, when they're on Small World, they come out just sort of smiling and delighted. And then you had to let them go. And then their eyes kind of rolled back in their heads. They were a little <laughs> bit worried to take on Disneyland all by themselves. They look like frightened horses sometimes. But then you said goodbye and walked back had a half hour lunch and took out another group. It was busy. We covered an awful lot of those 72 acres every day. And were you just doing two groups a day? Yeah. In general, if you were a tour guide, a regular tour guide, you do two groups a day. If you're a VIP hostess, and the year I was hired, which was 69, as you said, they merged the two groups. But basically, the VIP hostesses, they were older. Some of them had been Disneyland ambassadors. Lots of them were girls from different countries. It wasn't that they just had four years of high school Spanish. They actually grew up in Holland or Japan or Spain. You know, they were from all over the world. Mm -hmm. So those girls we kind of looked up to, and they had awesome uniforms that we were jealous of. Um, we had the little riding caps and Prince Charles tartan plaids, and right. we carried actual English riding crops, and oh my lord, I can't tell you how many times people said, where's your horse? <laughs> like, that was the first time you'd ever heard that, but right. oh, I heard that all day in, day out. But um, so they, they would have a group, either a large group or a small group, um, and just have them all day. And so we all got to do that during our time there, but there were some girls who were year-round employees, and they did that much more often than we did. And I know there's a lot of uh, etiquette that kind of goes with being a tour guide or even a VIP uh, you know, host. Um, so what are some of the maybe the do's and the don'ts of, of being a tour guide? Oh, gosh. <clears throat> I think it's mainly just use common sense. Mm. Uh, don't embarrass anyone. Right. Um, just treat people. Well, most of us treated people because we were used to doing it anyway. We were almost all from Southern California. Just treat people as though you, they were your family who had come in from out of town and you had this 
awesome, cool place to show them, mm -hmm. and you were just delighted because all of us, I never heard anybody who was a tour guide who was jaded or felt like ho-hum or this is kind of boring. I just never got that impression from anybody. It was exciting and fun, and you just wanted to share it with people. Right. So I think just being nice to people and smiling and being friendly to them, it was the best training for the rest of your life, really. Yeah. You could just about talk to anybody about anything. Right, right, absolutely. Well, you have to on this, if you're filling that much time. Yeah, you that's know. right. You're with them for three hours. You better right. think of something to say. Right. It, it would probably be a very difficult uh, job for an introvert. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I I consider myself actually more introverted than extroverted, for sure. But when you're on stage, and, you know, that's what they call it, when you're mm -hmm. on stage, like my son is an actor. He's also a dentist, but he acts in a lot of different productions and he's fairly introverted too but it's a role you're playing and that's the way they pitch it to you too casting you for a role in our Disneyland show that was what was on the uh, training materials right. and it's it's like a lot of performers do have they're more shy basically I know Billy Joel is that way and, and a lot of people are but when you're with people you can't ever think about yourself. You have to think about what can I do to make this fun for them. Mm -hmm. It was the same when I was a teacher. You don't think about yourself. You think about what do these kids need and it was the same thing with the guests. What would make them have the best possible experience when they're here? Because for some of them it's a once in a lifetime experience. Sure. They're not coming back. Well I mentioned it in the uh, the introduction so I've got to ask. Are you, are you at liberty to discuss some of the more famous guests that you've guided? No! No, one of my famous guests, holy cow, I am scared blue. I'm telling you right now, there is no way in the world that I would, because holy Moses, no, he is so famous and he is so powerful, and he was the worst guest I ever had in my entire life, and I never had a bad guest. I never had a bad guest, but this guy, is holy he, he's Moses. He's still alive today then, you're saying? Big, he was a big deal. And he's a bigger deal now and not a very nice person okay. at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I can't because I'm, I am nervous about, no, oh, criminy. No. Okay. Well. <laughs> maybe, maybe after we're off the air, huh? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that, that, that's good. Well, I don't want to get you in trouble. The last thing I want to do is... No, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to I'll read the you paper, that. you know, Disney author, former teacher, awesome person, winds up dead because of some boneheaded podcast. I, I, you just <laughs> never know. Yeah. 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 But we saw a lot of famous people. I'm mm. Sammy Davis Jr. and Yul Brenner and lots of the big stars of the day would have... So whenever you would see one of the VIP hostesses, the regular ones, you would always look to see who's, who's trailing along behind them. Sure. Because mm. yeah, we had uh, we had lots of people coming into the park with their kids and families and their sunglasses, and that was fun. Yeah. So I know nowadays when you take one of the the guided tours, that you know they kind of bring you to the front of the line on certain attractions. Was that the same uh, back in the day when you were doing it, Andre? No, Walt Disney had a philosophy that it didn't matter who you were, everybody was equally important, and it doesn't matter if you're a VIP, it doesn't matter of whatever other than security um, reasons, like for example, when Vice President Nixon came, when they opened the... Oh, gosh, let's see, what year was that? I want to say 59, when they opened the submarines, the Matterhorn, a big part of Tomorrowland changed. It was, it was a huge change in the park. And with somebody like the vice president, you're not going to make him stand on the line and going back and forth in those queues. Right. But that would only be security. For anybody else, you're, you're waiting in line. Nobody got to jump the queue. Nobody. I mean, nowadays, that's probably one of the top reasons people do the you know VIP tours is to get to the line. Absolutely. Line. And they cost a lot more than $6.50. <laughs> Truth. <laughs> a little bit. True that. <laughs> yeah. But I, yeah. I, I was lucky enough to be a part of a tour and it's well worth it yeah <laughs> i mean yeah for that experience plus our tour guide was pretty amazing and and it's, it's now did you do it at disneyland or disney world uh, 
I shouldn't say unfortunately, but it was at Disney World. Mm. I would uh, I would give a body part to do it at Disneyland. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I was still, that'd be pretty awesome. Still pretty great. I'm not well. Lie. The reason the reason I wrote Cream of the Crop to begin with was there was a book by a girl who had been a VIP hostess at Disney World, and she wrote a book about her experiences. It's called The Ride Delegate. Annie mm-hmm. Salisbury wrote it, and I read it. And at the back of it, there was a note from the editor, Bob McLean. It said, if you have a Disney story to tell, contact me and tell me about it. So I did. I told him, I have a Disney story to tell, but it's Disneyland, the early years. And he said, I've been looking for somebody to tell the story of the Disneyland tour guides as they were just getting started. So that's how I decided to write the book to begin with. Well, we've got a couple questions about the book specifically. And, you know, we'll just give you this blanket caveat. We want everyone to go read the book and we don't want you to give too much information away. But there's a couple things in the book that struck our fancy and we would love for you to share a little bit about one of the things that you mentioned was the Yippee invasion. That was something else. Do you want me to talk about that a little bit? I would love for you to talk about it a little bit, but I I want to make sure that you don't give so much information away that you feel like you're giving it for free because we want people to go get a copy of the book. Oh, that's okay. I think it's so nice that you read the book. That's very kind of you. Yeah, it was, let's see, August 6th, and that was chosen deliberately because it was the commemoration of the atomic bomb day and this was supposed to be something for peace and it was 1970 and that was the year that we were training all the kids who were out in Southern California from Florida because they were going to open their park in 71 so they were job shadowing us and we had all been prepped on it we knew what was going to happen we knew that they were but the estimates were as high as 200,000. Now, this was at a time when 75,000 was a very big day for us. And we were just thinking, oh, boy, that's going to just choke everything. Well, that didn't happen. And early in the morning, you would just see a few kind of scruffy looking guys and kind of hippie looking. And Disney was real strict about dress codes back in those days, very strict. (laughs) And so they, but they sort of let him in. Dick Nunes was vice president in those days, and he kind of waved him through. And as the day wore on, we would be taking our tours, and people would be looking around and saying, is this your usual clientele? No, not really. It's sort of a special day um, for hippies and hippies. But little by little, as the day went on, things started heating up. And, oh, they took over Tom Sawyer's Island. And, of course, Mm. it's like drum beats you hear from one cast member to another. And all this stuff gets passed through the park really fast. The biggest gossips in the world were the the Ratlaw boys on the trains because they went from one place to another all day long. And they would tell the tour guides, and then it would spread like wildfire. But eventually, as the day went on and there started getting, I guess they didn't get the response that they thought they would. They thought there would be a big publicity. There was a lot of photographers, and they used to have a boat. I don't know if you were old enough to have seen it, but it was called the Chicken of the Sea, and it was a, a little restaurant in Fantasyland by Monstro the Whale, and the hippies started climbing up the riggings of it and hanging off and calling stuff out to people, and it's just got to be a little bit more aggressive Mm -hmm. and eventually for the first time in gosh probably I think it was since John F. Kennedy was assassinated they decided to close the park early and so long about well about the time my shift was over they were hurting the guests out of the park and the hippies and yippies didn't want to go and all of a sudden it got, it was so dramatic on Main Street mm-hmm. Dick Nunes who had been extremely nice to all of the guests he always was anyway he's such a professional but it was just like a snap and the Orange County Riot Squad all appeared lining up and down Main Street with their batons and shields and 
We were told to lie down on the floor in the tour guide office, which was the weirdest thing, to have that many girls sitting there lying on the floor, but yet wanting to peek out the windows, and then they'd yell at us if somebody was looking out the window. And this was in the day before cell phones, so there wasn't a lot of communication possible. But you didn't know what they were going to do. Were they going to throw rocks through the windows yeah. or get violent? They were um, focused on the Bank of America because because it was seen at that time as being supporting the Vietnam War. And they got into tussles with um, people. Oh, there was a lot of veterans. A lot of dads had been in World War II, and these guys were very anti-military. So, yeah, eventually, eventually we got out of there. But meanwhile, it was honestly, that's probably the only time I can ever remember feeling scared. Yeah. When I have been at Disneyland, and they had to, the the uh, security guards who were so always so nice to us, and we knew most of them, and they would take us in little groups across Town Square and out the cast um, door over by the in between where the plaza is on one side and the in betweens on the other where the cast seats, mm-hmm. and they took us out through that way. But scary, yeah, it, that yeah. was it was a very very strange day. You know, you, you you don't associate those those emotions with Disney, Disneyland, yeah. or Never. Walt Disney World. You just yeah. don't. No, so, and you know, too bad for the people that were there because, as I said, for some of them, they've come halfway around the country. They've mm-hmm. saved up all their money to go do this with their kids, and you know, they got chased out early because of that. It was it was kind of the times, you know, that was just stuff that was going on in general. Lots of protests, and mm-hmm. they ran the um, the North Vietnamese flag up the flagpole on Fort Wilderness out on Tom Sawyer's Island, and oh, lots wow. of uh, marijuana smoke in the caves there, and yeah, it was it was one wild day. Great. I, I've yeah. never heard of yeah. that until now, so that's very interesting. Yeah, it was uh, it was quite a day, yeah. quite a day. There's another uh, chapter in your book, and I don't want to, like John said, I don't want you to give everything away, but it's called Date Night at Disneyland. So, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what Date Night in Disneyland was uh, back then? It's just about the sweetest thing you can ever imagine. What a perk for, there were 3,000 of us who worked there just in the summers and seasonal. Most of us were college kids, and so you worked your school vacations. And then there were 3,000 who were full-time permanent employees. But for those of us who were saving our money and paying for our tuition, to be able to get into Disneyland after work on Friday night starting at 6 o'clock and you could bring a date. You could bring somebody. It didn't have to be a date but for me it always was. And so you would bring somebody with you and you could just go through the park until it closed and watch the fireworks and all the things I don't know if you remember this part in my book but when you were on a tour and it didn't matter if it was 100 degrees out, you never were allowed to take a sip of water or sit down in in front of a guest wow. ever under so we all got in line at the guest relations and they let you in but the really cool thing was you you barely ever had to use any tickets on anything because the ride operators knew you and just waved you through mm. and something back in those days that most people didn't know both of the entrance turnstiles were open even though 99 percent of the people would go through the one on the right and so it would just be backed up from here to kingdom come i mean it would be out the door but if the left one was open you could just go through that one too because that was as open as the other one but no one knew it and i think my um my boyfriend at the time, he thought that was the hottest thing he'd ever done is just to walk through like nobody there and everybody else glaring at you and just walk right on the ride. Um, and I don't think that works so much anymore. Not with, <laughs> um, you know, I think people are wise to that. But back in those days, not so much. So that was fun. But we just went and hung out and went shopping and went on all this stuff. The free entertainment that they had was amazing. So it was almost a cost-free date Mm. and when you're watching your money as we were in those years that was uh that was so cool and then you see all your friends there too with their significant others it was very much fun did date night kind of evolve to like disney after dark 
Was that like the next evolution? Disney After Dark was what they called it back in the, I want to say early 60s. -hmm. They had a big marketing campaign called Disney After Dark, trying to get people to go when the lights come on, the fun starts and all that sort of thing. It was a campaign. But yes, now the extra park hours and we just got back from a trip to Florida and they had something called Disney After Hours. Have you ever heard of that before? I went last Thursday. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's awesome because we had never gone to it before. But my daughter and her husband, and they met at Disneyland in the college program, they went to Disney After Hours and couldn't believe how much fun that was. In Florida, it's only about six times a year. Yeah, right. Yeah, but oh, well worth it and really cool. And that's kind of what it used to be like back in the day right. yeah. before things got so, so, so crowded, before they gave the annual passes. It just never got that crowded. And if you went in February, it was like Chamble Weeds Down Main Street. Yeah. I mean, there was nobody there. Yeah. Right. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. I know. Now it's all the time. Yeah. What A book I just wrote was A Mouse for All Seasons, trying to... Uh, figure out when the best time is to go, but there's no more of those empty months. No. Thank you, Disney Marketing. Yeah. We talk about that quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. I do, too. Yeah. Yep. They've been in those parties with the Halloween starting in August. Yeah, yeah. crazy. Yeah, they don't miss a trick. No, no, they don't. I, I was a marketing director for a uh, Disney-centric travel agency for several years, and yeah. it's fascinating when you when you start working with that company they literally are not missing a trick and they're, nope. they're learning and, and getting smarter and faster and how they implement things so anyway absolutely that's a, that's a now, have they thing. started with the magic bands at disneyland yet i don't think they have, have yeah they? no not yet. not yet yeah not yet those are amazing i highly recommend and yes it's a marketing it's a marketer's dream when you stay at a disney property hotel you get a free one but then they sell them in the park for like 25 and 30 dollars yep. you've already got the free one but then you have to buy another one that has a picture of pinocchio on it right. i mean it's the weirdest thing but people do oh yeah yeah absolutely oh, yeah. yeah so as we kind of start yeah. winding down here um one of the things that you mentioned earlier was the dress code at Disneyland. Yeah. Uh, what and and we've seen pictures of people at Walt Disney World in the 70s walking around in what we would call professional outfits and I can't even fathom walking around in summertime with a, a coat on, but apparently people did that. Could you explain the dress code at Disneyland? I'm assuming for the guests. Oh, yeah, and us, too. Um, in those days, you know, all the guys were wearing their hair super shaggy. But if you worked at Disneyland, your sideburns could come no further than, you know, that little bump on the inside of your ear. It's yeah. called the tragus, I think. Could mm-hmm. not go any further than that. Wow. And wow. you couldn't have hair over your collar. And if you were a girl, you had to have your hair curled. You couldn't just have long, straight hair. You had to, and some girls did. They had gorgeous long, straight hair. And they have to curl it every morning so that they had curl in their hair. Wow. And you couldn't have your hair too high, um, which was really a popular style in those days. Yeah. And I can remember him sticking a ruler down in my hair. And saying, okay, you just made the two inches. All right, don't get it any higher. Or you got to take it down a little bit there, Andrea. <laughs> Makeup had to be, for girls, had to be very natural looking. Nothing, like the only thing you could wear was mascara, a little bit of uh pink on your cheeks and very, very neutral lipstick and clear nail polish. And that was it. Yeah, it was so strict. I mean, it was, people got fired over it. I mean, there was a guy on Jungle Cruise that actually got fired because he wouldn't get his hair cut. So they were serious about it. But the guests, too, they were just coming out with tank tops for guys, and those were strictly taboo. It was thought that those would completely... um, Offend all the ladies. Yeah. So no, no tank tops and no holes in your clothing, and no offensive slogans, and 
But yet, I saw women all the time coming with their hair in rollers, in pink curlers all over their head, (laughs) coming to Disneyland. Now, that was okay. And I always wanted to say, honey, where are you going tonight? If right. if you're bringing your hair and curlers to Disney, what's your big plan for later? Right. right. But yeah, it's, it was weird. It was just mm-hmm. strange. And eventually, you know, after the hippie and all that kind of stuff, um, that day they really cracked down on it for a while. After that, and later I had one of the guys on my VIP tour that he didn't make the cut in terms mm-hmm. of his clothes weren't not. He was a singer. And he did not make the cut for coming into the park. They had to pin him up. And then his um, publicist had to go buy a T-shirt for him because his was too ratty looking. So, I mean, they they were serious as all get out about that. I mean, nowadays, yeah. I, I, I kind of, you know, get taken aback by what some people wear to a, to a park. I'm like, was there not a mirror in your hotel room before you left? Um, right. You know, right. there's yeah, things I yeah. need to see. But it's like... Yeah, it's, it was just the times, I think, but Disney was extremely strict. And for a lot of people, they couldn't cope with it. They didn't like it, then they wouldn't work there very long. So one of the last questions is, what would you tell uh, someone that wanted to become a, a tour guide now? I believe now, when when I became one, you could go directly into that level of work. And you just had this extensive training course and job shadowing somebody else, but I never worked at anything else. I worked at that job from the time I got hired all the way through until I graduated from college. Nowadays, I believe, just judging by Annie Salisbury's book, Mm -hmm. that they work other jobs and eventually apply to guest relations. And it takes... I think you have to prove yourself. You have to have a proven track record, mm-hmm. recommendations from your supervisors and that sort of thing before you could be accepted into the program. But back in my day, it was just, you know, could you smile? Did you fit the suit? You know? Right. Um, yeah, be that nice sort of people. stuff. <laughs> yeah, if you were nice to people and charming and friendly, that was the main criteria. Yeah, best job ever, I'll tell you. I, I've had other jobs since then, and nothing, and almost everybody I've ever heard of who works at the park would say that was the best job they ever had. So, Andrew, where, where can people find uh, more about you and your books? Well, my books are published by Theme Park Press, and this is a presence on Amazon.com. So if you type in my last name, which is K-E-E-C-H, Andrea Keach, then you would see the Disney books that I have written come up, which Cream of the Crop was the first one. The newest one is A Mouse for All Seasons, and that talks about, and, and most of my books since Cream of the Crop have been about Walt Disney World because I live in Iowa, and here everybody goes to Florida. But I did write one my editor suggested because I told him I stole my name tag and everybody steals their name tags. I don't know a single person who didn't take their name tag. I took mine. Um, I mean, <laughs> of course, who wouldn't? My uh, friend in book club, she took hers and she was Chippendale and um, all kinds of small, the smaller uh, characters. And my daughter took four. She did two from Disneyland, two from Disney World. She was Liz and Elizabeth, so she had two from each nice. place. Yeah. But he suggested, why don't you do some uh, a mystery? And it's the only fiction one I have. It's called The Treasure of the Ten Tags. And it's about Disney name tags leading to treasure. And mm-hmm. it does the through the decades, looking at different jobs at Disney over the different decades, one per decade. So right. that was a fun one to write. I would say my most most popular one is the Walt Disney World Dining Guide 2018. That one's been a real good seller. But I haven't done Disneyland yet. But my most recent book is that I still have a couple of more chapters to do. 50 Fun, Fabulous Foods from Disney Parks Around the World. And there's a lot of good Disney stuff in there, like the Dole Whip and the churros, frozen bananas, the Monte Cristo. So a lot of dis- nods to d- my old days at Disneyland in there. Well, yeah. not to put you on the spot, you don't have to say yes or no, but we would love to have you back on the show to talk about that book when it comes out. 
Oh, sure. I would, too, because you know what? It's been the most fun to write. Cool. Yeah. I just had tea at the Grand Floridian High Tea myself, all by myself, and little um, swans made out of pastry. It was the most fun thing. So researching the 50 fun, fabulous foods, holy cow, I don't think there's a better job than that, yeah. other than tour guide, maybe. <laughs> True. All right, we can't uh, really thank you enough for coming on and, and telling us all these great stories because uh, you were there, like, from the beginning of Disneyland, so that's yeah. fascinating to us. Uh, well, it's been delightful talking to you both. I really enjoyed it, and I appreciate that you got my book. That was very nice of yeah. you. Yeah. So oh, well, it's our pleasure. Yeah, and we'll have to have you back on to talk about the other seven. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Thanks, guys. All right, thanks for coming on, and uh, we'll see you on the parks. The Disney Parks Podcast is not affiliated with the Walt Disney Company. All Disney Parks, attractions, lands, shows, event names, etc. are registered trademarks of the Walt Disney Company. Like a boat out of the blue Fate steps in and sees you through